Jared and Alex in the morning. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jared Spagnola. I work in marketing at John Owen Services. And I'm Alex Perrier, and I, uh, I do sales. Awesome. Today we're going to talk to you guys about heat pumps in space heating. Yeah, and specifically we're going to talk about uh, the different styles of heat pumps. Um, standard heat pump or hyperheat heat pumps. Alex, what brand do we typically use for our heat pumps? Well, we use two brands primarily. We use uh, Mitsubishi, mm -hmm. um, which I think makes the better products. But we also have American Standard, uh, which is uh, more of a, uh, an American legacy brand, mm -hmm. uh, more traditional heat pump style. Okay. And so uh, how, do, how do heat pumps work? Are they, do they work just like a traditional furnace, gas furnace? Not at all. So a, a traditional furnace um, burns gas to create heat. So it actually... A traditional furnace makes heat. A, a heat pump actually only transfer heat and we use electricity to transfer heat and that allows us to get really really high efficiency levels because we're not making heat. Again we're just transferring it either from inside the house to outside in the summer mm -hmm. or outside to inside in the winter. Okay so these units provide heating and cooling? That's right so it's a really you know if you're looking to uh, upgrade your furnace and you're thinking about going electric, one of the side benefits of using a heat pump is you also get cooling, which, um, you know, in, in our area, a lot of people did not need it 10 years ago, but now times have changed. Yeah, definitely. So I heard you say that uh, it's moving heat from one place to another. Um, will these heat pumps still work in cold weather? Yes, they do, but they do lose efficiency and mm -hmm. start working harder. Um, the, the refrigerants that we're using to transfer heat boil at really low temperatures and the expansion of the gas is how we extract energy. Yeah. Um, most heat pumps start losing efficiency at 47 degrees. So when it's 47 degrees and lower outside, you start losing efficiency fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. And uh, once you get down to our freezing point, our lowest in our area is about 30 degrees, 29 degrees. Mm -hmm. uh, at that point, it doesn't produce a whole lot of heat. Um, spec sheets will show about 80% efficiency. The kicker though is that it'll also go into a defrost mode. And okay. so a heat pump, you might size it, you might do a heat load calculation on the house, a manual J setup and say, well at 80% I, I'm, I'm, I have just enough heat. But the thing to keep in mind is there's also the defrost cycle, which can yep. be up to 15 minutes out of every hour. So wow. your 80% of your heat only 75% of the time, you can see that we can run into problems if we don't size it correctly. Are there solutions to those problems besides sizing? Uh, is it yes. different units? Are there things we could install? Well, the, the traditional way of doing it is to have a, a backup source of heat. Okay. You know, that's the way that we've done it for years. Uh, and it's still a good option in a lot of cases. Uh, and, and there's two ways of doing that. One is uh, what's called a dual fuel setup. Okay. So a dual fuel setup uses a heat pump and connect it to a gas furnace. The gas furnace does double duty in this, in this setup. It does, uh, it moves the air around like any, any heating system mm -hmm. and, um, and it'll provide heat when the temperature uh, gets too low and the heat pump either can't keep up or becomes more expensive to run. Yeah, just inefficient yeah. in general, okay. So that's a good option, especially for a larger house, whereas a heat pump wouldn't work uh, because heat pumps don't come in, in as, as big of a BTUs. Okay. So I can get a really big furnace, really powerful furnace, but I'm pretty restricted on heat pumps. Uh, the downside of it is that you're still burning fossil fuel. And, yeah. and you know, I'll say that, um, well, we get all kinds of people that are interested in heat pumps, right? We have people who want energy independence. We have people who want to decarbonize their house. We have people who uh, got solar and want to extract as much use out of that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and then we have people who just absolutely hate PG&E and don't want to give them any more of their money. <laughs> yeah. So I get a lot of that, actually. Yeah. That's fair. We all saw our gas prices this winter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, uh, and so, then, so besides the dual fuel system, is there anything else that we can do? I know you said that there were a couple options. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the second option is an electric heat strip. Okay. So a, an electric heat strip is, I compare it to a toaster element. So if you've ever seen inside your toaster, you see those red 
or your toaster oven. Mm -hmm. It's basically that, but using a lot of power. Okay. So that, that will take care of you while your system's in defrost mode. And you can get even bigger ones that'll actually heat your house. Uh, but they draw a lot of power. Okay. And so, you know, part of doing this is to be as energy efficient as possible. You sure. know, there's no point in decarbonizing if you're going to be burning a bunch of electricity or, or getting solar panels and then wasting all that power in a heat strip. Mm -hmm. so, so, yes, it will work, but there's downsides to it as well. You have to yeah. do like a whole other installation. It's not part of the unit, right? Right. Yeah, it's not part of the unit. Uh, it requires more electricity. It requires a second circuit and it drives up the cost of the installation. What if I didn't want to do the gas or the heating element because I'm losing the efficiency? Ah, well then we're going to go to the newer high-tech stuff. It's called hyperheat. Hyperheat, okay. Yeah. And, and there's not a lot of manufacturers that have it. I'm, as far as I know, only Mitsubishi does this. And um, yeah, it's it works great down to really, really low temperatures. Okay. Um, so lower than what we would see in our region, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Down in the negative degrees, no problem. Okay. Um, and and down to lower than ten degrees, even at hundred percent capacity. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So that's it's a really good option. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. And then um, as far as the hyperheat goes, what other benefits does that unit have for the home? Oh, so many. So. Uh, the, the main ones that I would say is comfort, okay. right? So as the temperature drops outside, the heat coming out of your vents is going to also start to go down. And sure. you might say, well, 90 degree air sounds comfortable to me, but actually 90 degree air coming across your skin can feel cooler. A gas furnace, for example, is 120 degrees. Mm -hmm. So you don't get that nice feeling. And with the hyperheat, it, it runs hotter and it runs hotter quicker. So you don't have a cold breeze when the system uh, starts up. So you mentioned that gas furnaces are hotter. Do they come out of the register hotter than a heat pump? Yeah, yeah. The air, the air is uh, is just feels a little bit hotter coming out of of the registers because it is hotter. Okay. And and that's you know that brings up another point. You know, heat pumps are great, but they're a little bit different. Mm -hmm. you know? And how so? Well. The, the the one that I'm talking about right here is, is yeah, the, the air temperature. So if you have a little old lady that's always shivering in her house mm -hmm. that likes to sit under the vent, maybe a heat pump's not great for her. Why not? Well, because the air will feel a little colder to her. Got you. Right? But that's a pretty rare thing. You know, most people, uh, heat pumps have been around for a really long time and they do fine for lots of people all over the world. Okay. So... And then the other advantage is uh, of the hyperheat is that it's um, it it has a lot less uh, defrost cycles. That's so, great. Yeah, that's great. So it heats the house uh, longer for longer periods of time in each hour. And then the kicker is that it comes on much hotter than a standard heat pump. Starts standard, hotter. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So a regular heat pump takes a little bit of time before it gets up to temperature, and and that that could create like a cold draft in your house. Yeah. You know? Okay. So this, this kind of eliminates that problem. That's great. Yeah. Uh, as far as pricing goes, how does a hyperheat compare to a regular just heat pump for space heating? Well, it, it is substantially more expensive, but uh, the, the cost of the heating strips and the electrical, if you were going to go with the regular standard heat pump, they brings it pretty darn close okay. to, to what a hyperheat would be. And uh, so at the end of the day, you know, you're not paying a whole lot more for something that, that's going to be way more efficient and way more comfortable. And also, you know, keep you warm uh, when, when we have those really cold spells. Yeah. Okay. So it sounds like the hyperheat is the way to go. Yeah. The hyperheat in a lot of situations is going to be the way to go. But again, you know, we... We do heat load calculations on every one of our jobs. Yep. Uh, we don't guess at this. Mm -hmm. We try to be as scientific as possible in all of our uh, all of our installs. And you know, it used to be with furnaces, I had choices of 60, 80, or 100,000 BTU. Well, I can guess that pretty close. But with a heat pump, you know, the biggest hyperheat is 48,000 BTU. So I have to be very careful. Wow, that's and a so it's a significantly less amount. It's yes, it is. But keep in mind that a lot of the houses originally had giant furnaces because they had poor windows, poor insulation, and all these things have been updated over the years. So, and and you know honestly, 
most HVAC contractors, they go out there, they see a 100,000 BTU furnace, they replace it with a 100,000 BTU furnace, when the house would do just fine with 60,000. Okay. And this is all things we discover, uh, you and know. downgrading a system size like that could make your your utility bills lower too, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely, okay. absolutely. Wow. And, and the house more comfortable. Oversizing your system does no good at all. It's not like... Uh, a properly sized system will eat your house, heat, not eat. Not eat. <laughs> not heat. It will heat your house much more comfortably and evenly and Great. help distribute the heat more. If you're, if you're heating your house a little bit slower, then the air has more time to blend and create more comfort. So there's a lot of advantages to doing a heat load calc on your house. Okay. Uh, and it's critical when we're moving from gas to a heat pump where the margin of error is a lot smaller. One more thing I want to touch on right now is that um, having going from gas furnace to a heat pump might require you to change the way you use your heating system. Okay, how so? Well, Jared, was your dad the kind of, of dad that would turn off the heat at night and turn it back on in the morning? Yep. Yeah. I think still to this day, maybe. Yeah. So that's the way a lot of people um, use their heating system. They turn it off at night. And they might even turn it off in the daytime and only use it in the morning and the evening. Mm -hmm. And with a gas furnace, that works just fine. Uh, you can heat your house really, really quickly. And uh, so you get up in the morning, your house is 55 degrees. You turn it on 15 minutes later, the house is 70 degrees. Yep. Not a big deal. When it's really cold out, a heat pump would not be able to do that. Okay. It just Why won't. No, is it because of the, the lower temperature? What, what's causing yeah, that? It, it, it just doesn't have as many BTUs. It okay. just doesn't have enough... Um, enough heat production to bring a house very quickly. You know, it can heat your house very quickly if the temperature outside is not too cold. But on those frosty mornings, um, you cannot expect your heat pump to go from uh, uh, 55 degrees to a comfortable 70 degrees in under a few hours. It, it will take time. You know, okay. it'll go up to 60 and then it'll start struggling. So the trick to it is to keep a constant heat in the house. Got you. Yeah. So keep the system running. Keep the system running. Um, don't if you like it colder at night, you can set it back. You can set it back two to five degrees. It depends on the house. Depends on the temperature. Mm -hmm. um, but don't let it the house get too cold. Okay. You know? And you'll create more comfort that way in the house because the objects in the house will maintain their heat. Sure. And will radiate the heat. Yep. So you won't have the system turning on and off as much. Now the really interesting part is that the way that heat pumps work. Um, they're more efficient when they're running slow and low. Okay. And, and so you'll find that even if you ride your system on and off in two parts of the day, let's say you turn it on in the morning, you make it work really hard, and you turn it on at night, you make it work really hard, okay. you're going to use as much electricity as if you just left it on all day long. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's crazy because it has to do with the inverter technology in the, in the, uh, in the compressors, and they work best and extremely efficient when they're running slow and low. That's great to know. I'm glad you stopped me and, and informed me of this. I would have been lost and probably using my equipment equipment wrong. Yeah, and yeah. raising your bills and lowering your comfort. Yeah. You know, there's no reason to turn it down if it doesn't save you money. That was the entire point of turning your furnace off in the middle of the night is to save money. And that's just not necessary with the heat pumps. Good to know. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jared. Thank you. Is that too long? No, dude. I, I think letting these things ride whatever time uh -huh. they go is like super important. Um.